Mm -hmm. Am I still waiting, Hope? Yep, we're okay now. Okay, good. Well, so we should have a, an audience watching us on YouTube too. But uh, am I still welcome to, our, welcome to the March meeting of the uh, Residents Council. Uh, as usual, we'll begin the meeting by observing a uh, moment of silence and uh, taking a look at those who passed in the past month. Well, thank you all. And uh, now we'll um, start off with the meeting. I think we have a couple of guests with us tonight. Um, one who you'll be hearing more about is Lucy McCain. And, uh, and Heather you know, is not here yet. Heather's not here yet. I see Charles Stanton is among us too, and he's always welcome. Mm -hmm. Hi, Charles. Uh, our, let's see, where are we here? Uh, get my papers in order. Um, our first item is the approval of last month's uh, minutes, which all of you have uh, been sent an email and should have seen. Does anybody have any changes or corrections to the minutes from the last month? Seeing none, I will declare the meetings approved, the minutes approved. And um, with that, uh, now we move on and take a look at mission moments. You may have experienced, experienced the sinking feeling when your car doesn't uh, want to go, when you have a distinct need to get something done right away. David Dowds recommended Lucy McCain for a mission moment when she saw him in that situation. On a Thursday afternoon, Dave Dowds was ready to drive down to Giant to pick up a large grocery order when he discovered his car battery was dead. I've been there too. Uh, he tried calling two friends to see if they could help with backup transportation. Neither one was available. As he stood there trying to figure out what to do next, Lucy approached him, uh, indicating that she'd overheard his dilemma. She recognized Dave from his work on the residence council and she would be happy to give him a, a lift down to Giant. Dave thanked her profusely for offering to help and she drove him to Giant for the grocery pickup. This is a good example of kindness, caring, responsibility, and helping build relationships within our community. Thank you, Lucy. You're welcome. <laughs> Several residents have experienced Peggy Ryber's friendliness. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, her friendliness, her enthusiasm, her caring and respect, all of which exemplify Eric's and living values. While many neighbors and friends show support and sympathy during difficult times, Peg is apt to follow up with questions about when the next doctor's appointment will be, and if you'd like to have a ride to that appointment. No, it'd be no problem to wait while you see the doctor. Another question might be about what groceries are needed because she's going to the store and would be no trouble to pick up what you need. She's also ready to go for a walk when you're ready to get out. And she thinks about social distance by walking in the street while you walk on the sidewalk. If you think Peg is nothing to do but run errands for her friends and neighbors, in the past, she took on organizing the conference center for treasure sales. Now, since the usual treasure sales are on hold, she's helped with the Tuesday morning routine for Treasures Unlimited. She also helps with the finance team for Our Lady of Angels congregation. Peg always makes you feel good when you encounter her friendly, upbeat spirit. She's a good example of harmonious community living. And uh, with those good examples, um, Phil Lansing uh, would love anyone who has good nominations for people to be nominated for, um, um, for similar mission moments. Uh, please get in touch with Phil and pass them along. It's always nice to uh, recognize people who have done so much for the community. Well, with that, I'll move on to my comments. Looking back, it's been just about a year since we locked down for the coronavirus epidemic and it's been quite a year. At first, the residence council members shut down and locked themselves in their rooms as everyone else did. Our activities came to a virtual halt and we stopped meeting together for several months. 
We kept in touch by telephone and email, but it wasn't the same. Then we discovered Zoom and we began to learn new ways of socializing and working together using our computers and devices. A few of us were already pretty handy with these tools, but uh, others had a big learning curve to go through and it was a challenge for everyone. As our council members learned to work together online, we reached out to our committee members and asked them to join in committee meetings too and helped a lot of residents become more comfortable Zooming together. Uh, we weren't the only ones going through the learning adventure as a lot of Charlestown's many clubs and organizations invented new ways to get back together. Who would have dreamed that a photography club could thrive with all its members in separate locations? Or that you could play bingo from different rooms? Uh, even Alec is learning some new ways to communicate and educate and learn. Now, by the end of this week, nearly all of us will be vaccinated, a few more on Thursday, and ready to move on to find our new normal. It won't be immediate because the virus can still spread, the doctors tell us, even from those who've been vaccinated. We can still have the virus in our nasal passages. It hasn't all been bad, and we've learned a lot about communicating with each other along the way. I really want to thank the council members and committee members and our incredible staff for finding new solutions to new problems and making us as successful as possible. Thank you all, and let's keep on learning, and let's move on. Uh, one more note that to, I'd like to make. The, there's an ELEC class introducing the Residence Council next Monday at 10 a.m. Uh, it originally was going to be in a classroom, but it's set up to be as a Zoom class. We don't have a lot of people, and there's lots of room for people to come and uh, join in or witness the Zoom class on the Residence Council, which I'll be giving. Um, and uh, if anybody would like to... Uh, to join, get in touch with Hope. We'll send you a link so you can uh, join in uh, and tell committee members you might be in touch with. We're uh, telling people who may be running for uh, the council that it's a good time to learn about the council and so on. So keep that in mind. Well, that wraps up my comments for today. Um, and uh, now it's time to move on to uh, Pat for the vice president's report. Pat? Thanks, Hope. Um as everyone will hear uh, when the Finance Committee gives its report, our occupancy numbers are good, but they're not as good as they were pre-pandemic. So we know that the sales team is working really, really hard, but as Don Grove pointed out in the administrative update <clears throat> on Wednesday, the best salespeople for Charlestown are Charlestown residents. So I want to encourage everybody to talk to your friends, talk to your, uh, your family, see if some of them wouldn't like to come and take a look. Um, there is an unusually large number of apartments available. So people who are coming are going to have better choices than they might have under other circumstances. And don't forget, if you do this, to fill out the referral form because the, uh, there's some really attractive financial advantages to doing that. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Well, let's see. I don't believe our secretary or assistant secretary have any remarks this month. So we'll move on to Ron Diabro and take a look at the treasury. Thank you all. Well, the council's account balance at the end of January was $5,756. In February, the council received $10 in residence association dues. Expenditures for the month totaled $211.50. Thus, the council balance, the council's account balance at the end of February was $5,554.50. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, we'll move on to committee reports. And we'll lead off alphabetically with benevolent care with Jean Eichenlau. The philanthropy department attended the meeting. Patty opened the meeting by sharing the annual report of all philanthropy activities for 2020. The report will be cubby, cubby stuffed to all residents and extra copies will be placed in the sales office for, pers for prospective residents. 
treat of the quarter, discussion around whether we should change it, possible quarterly raffle, or maybe a calendar with coupons. A poll is in the sunburst in the March edition and philanthropy will review the replies and we can go from there. The treasure sale, no big sale yet. Ladies Boutique is offering as a new service starting in March, a personal shopper. Residents call and list the items they are looking for, size, color, et cetera, and a bag will be prepared and delivered to the resident. Emily reported on the success of special sales displays. The window sales display raised $1,300. Uh, Christmas and January jewelry sales, $1,600. And they will continue with these small sales. Friends and family, looking for ideas of how to contact family and friends to engage them in BCF and educate them about the Home for Life promise. Also, we are always looking for family members with testimonials of how their family member was able to remain in their apartment or assisted living through BCF. Hope Tillman suggested greater use of the resident website since families have access to it. There is currently information on the resident website about BCF and the link to the donation page. Memory Walk, currently 16 bricks are to be placed and two benches. Residents in the Arborside area raise money to place a bench in memory of Adele Marriott, the wife of Kenny Marriott, that she had worked at the PNC Bank also a memorial bench in memory of Angelina Van Opstel, a pioneer re resident of Charlestown who passed away in November, hoping to have a ceremony in May if the chapel has removed some of the restrictions. More to come. And don't know yet if we will meet in March. Thank you, Jean. Uh, next up is the communications committee. I think David Elder is, uh, no, Dick Krebs, oh, who's giving the clean? <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, David Elder opened the meeting and minutes from the January meeting were approved. We had 18 members attending, but no staff. Charlie Eichenlob gave an update on evergreen topics. We discussed Wi Fi stability. There's nothing new report on Wi Fi upgrade at this time. Someone asked about the COVID-19 warning signs. What do they mean? It is presumed to be a warning to visitors that the resident has been exposed and is in quarantine. Are we making good use of bulletin boards? There was discussing on should we, discussion on should we create a flyer advertising the CCI website to be posted on bulletin boards? Should we post evergreen topics on bullet boards? David shared a bit about the Zoom chat they had a second session yesterday and planned for more on Saturday mornings before bingo. Several topics could take advantage of this medium. We could interview club leaders. We could do a virtual fruit of our labors. Now this will require input from Mary Evans who was unable to attend the meeting. David suggested that we might consider a sort of radio flea market using Zoom. A Zoom happy hour and social events were discussed to combat isolation. Any database glitches should be reported to Wayne Smith. The corporate group will hopefully report prior to next month's meeting. Dick will post an announcement about the monthly council meetings on the bulletin board. The communications committee suggests that the council add the TV studio capital budget to their recommendation to send to the finance committee. We discuss residents council dues collection. Now, due to COVID-19, expenses were less than anticipated. No decision has been made at this time as to whether there will be a holler and survey this year. By the way, there is a help button on CCI Charlestown. Hope made a change to CCI Charlestown to move the menus to the top of the page. Hope updated us on website changes to include a tech help page. Zoom and My Erickson profile help are currently supported. I didn't print the other. Next month's meeting will be 
in uh, March. Hope you can attend. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. And next up, we'll uh, be updated on conservation by Anne Marie Strzoki. Um, Michelle Fenn from Housekeeping um, stated at the meeting that the 2020 Recycling and Trash Monthly Statistics would be sent to the committee later that day. Um, and uh, in the meeting though, the co we covered posters first. Posters have been rotated for three weeks and now they are on break. Michelle Fenn asked that posters not be placed in the main lobbies of uh, uh, the St. Charles lobby, the Charles Cross Creek and uh, Charlestown Square. Um, they are going to be restored. However, Mary Evans and her team may be creating more professional looking posters. Channel 972, various members of the Conservation Committee will record and report on the progress of conservation bills in the Maryland legislature. This is in conjunction with the Legislative Committee. The bills to be reported are HB 583 and the Senate Bill 414, the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2021, HB 164 and Senate Bill 116, Department of the Environment, Office of Recycling, Recycling Market Development, HB 280, Senate Bill 304, Maryland Recycling Act, Recyclable Materials and Resource Recovery Facilities, and, uh, Alterations, and Senate Bill 76, House Bill 33, Climate Crisis and Education Act. Regarding plastic in the laundry rooms, containers have signs requesting that residents bring their own plastic bags to the grocery stores. Sunburst. Mary Evans is now the editor of Sunburst. An article was published in the February Sunburst, and we would like additional articles to highlight conservers and restorers. We hope to have more articles that focus on conservation and climate change. The movie, The Story of Plastic, two members watched the film and believed that it would be valuable educational for Charlestown. Earth Day is April 22nd. The next meeting of the committee will be on March 16th, 2021 at two o'clock via Zoom. Thank you, Anna Marie. And next up is the always popular topic from Dining Services. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Walter. The Dining Services Committee met February the 15th at 2 p.m. This was again a hybrid Zoom Brookside Room 1 meeting. Attending were 18 guests, committee, and resident council members. Bob Caulfield welcomed Victor Serenia Cerrone, Assistant Director of Dining Services, and provided an update from our February the 10th meeting with him. We learned there are no current plans for the reopening of the refectory. Self-service salad bars and buffets are not currently practical. Staffing has improved to the extent of allowing the atrium to reopen. Currently, 50% of meals are served as carryout. The remainder split evenly between dine-in and delivery. Victor provided updates as follows. Beginning this week, 2.15, all items listed on the restaurant's menu can be ordered for carryout. This significantly increases the number of options available to residents. A number of committee members were not clear as to where to find the menus for the various dining rooms. Hope Tillman demonstrated and explained how to find them on cc1charlestown.org and on myerickson.com. There was a recommendation that menus should indicate they are available for both dining and carry out and not to be listed separately. It would be reasonable to assume residents are now beginning to look forward to an easing of restrictions and a return to some of the pleasures of dining they enjoyed prior to, to the pandemic. Niceties like a slice of lemon for tea, 
hand-dipped ice cream, Sunday brunch at the atrium, a drink at the bar, bistro dining, and a fresh banana or orange are solely missed. Victor reminded us COVID restrictions will remain for the foreseeable future. Even though most of us have been vaccinated, Charlestown must strictly comply with state and county health requirements and cannot reduce restrictions on their own. The meeting was then open for questions and comments. The fresh fruit cup dessert, the fruit is hard, tasteless. Others did not find it a problem. Everyone expressed how much they enjoyed the Valentine's Day meal. The box candy drop off was appreciated. Question, which carryout containers are not recyclable? Hope Tillman again was able to show members how to find this information on the CC of Charlestown and website. Noted phone service response time has greatly improved for carryout orders. Our next meeting of dining service will be March 15th at 2 p.m. Again, a BR1 Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Next um, yeah, I uh, just have one comment to add to it, and that is on Friday, Ken will be addressing the uh, issue about not bringing wine to the dining halls, which he, uh, he mentioned um, earlier. And uh, so people may be wanting to listen to that on Friday on 972 at 10 o'clock. Good, an important deadline. Uh, Next up is Gordon Pichet with the finance report. Oh, another question, Michael Rose. Michael, you're muted. Mike, you're muted. There we go. Okay. I When Ken did his question and answer uh, a couple of days ago, I, I called in because I had questions being put to me about the fruit. And uh, he pretty much said, they're not gonna offer that anymore. Uh, that was a big expense for them. They felt that uh, people were taking advantage of it by, I guess, walking out with a whole bag of bananas or something. Um, and that the only reason they had it anyway was that they were woefully short on fruit years ago. And so they thought that would be a good response to it. But now that we're getting the fruit cup and some other ways to supply fruit, he was kind of, he was in a nice way, he was indicating that that's a budgetary uh, decision and it's not coming back. So. Thanks, Mike. Anyway, there you go. Uh, just to make that clear, he's talking about pieces of fruit that you would, they used to give out at the end of meals that you exactly. could take back right. with you. Not about the fruit cups. No. Okay. Uh, then we, now we move on to finance report from, from Gordon. Good evening. The Finance Committee met on February 23rd with Director Pam Steiner, Assistant Finance Director Eric Schwab, Council President Walt Howe, Council Vice President Pat Rudolph, Council Secretary Hope Tillman, Council Treasurer Ron Diabro, and 11 committee members. We had two or three members of the committee missing. The meeting was called to order at 9 a.m. The occupancy data and financial package reports for January were presented by Eric Schwab. Independent living, 94%. Assisted living, 96.7%. Memory care, 100%. Skilled nursing, 72.4%. Independent living occupancy had a small increase over budget in January. The independent living is expected to remain steady for the next couple of months until the opening of Wilton Overlook Edition, which will have an impact on <clears throat> independent living occupancy in 2021. Settlements of new residents continue in independent living. The occupancy level in skilled nursing continue to be affected by the need to maintain the COVID unit and discontinuation of double occupancy rooms there. January operating revenue of 7,141,000 was 67,000 above budget and includes 208,000 for CARES Act federal relief funds. These funds will continue each month through June. Operating income was 496,000, which is $40,000 above budget. 
operating expenses were $27,000 below budget, despite incurring continued COVID expenses. Non-operating income for January was negative, 2,204,000, resulting in a decrease in net assets of 1,708,000. There are cash changes in cash flows, which decreased by two million seventy-one thousand to five million four hundred sixty-six thousand dollars cash at the end of the period. The balance sheet continues to be good. Regarding restricted funds, Benevolent Care expended one hundred eight thousand four hundred thirty-two dollars for the month of January. Sixteen residents received a total of ninety-eight thousand. $432 for January. It is possible that the number of residents receiving care will increase to 18 or 19 in the coming months. The Scholars Fund balance is $1,265,570 after making scholarship payments of $33,917. The Staff Appreciation Fund ended the year with a balance of $10,000 $789. Pat Rudolph asked about the annual submission to management of budget related items con considering the postponement of some capital expenditures. The committee agreed to review the list for late 2021 and 2022 of pending recommendations from the past as well as any cost reduction items. The committee will meet next on March 30th at 9 a.m. via Zoom. Thank you. Uh, next on the docket is uh, Mike, back to Michael Rose for the grounds report. Thanks, Walt. Um, the, first, let me say that uh, we had uh, 13 committee members and Kirill and um, Chris and Ryan uh, at the meeting. And I knew going into this that it was either gonna be a very lengthy meeting or very short because we had no new items. And a lot of the items that we're carrying over are pretty much beyond their control to finish up. So with that said, um, there, we're gonna meet uh, with the staff to go over the work plan to improve the outside drain at Brookside and plans to repair and repaint or whatever's necessary, fencing, lampposts, et cetera, along Erickson Way. As available, the committee will receive and discuss future plans for the nature trail and bridge, the report on the privet hedge and related soil samples, the five-year plan for all grounds projects and a priority list for them. But they were not able to supply those because some of that, you know, like the bridge uh, is beyond their control, whether, you know, what's gonna happen to it, how, what will, how will things be done to it, how it will be funded, that sort of thing. Some of it they're waiting for the spring um, to be able to describe and, and figure out what they're gonna do for landscaping and things like that. So. Um, we're due to meet uh, in March on the 23rd again, but um, unless some of these reports come in, I may ask to cancel that meeting if the committee agrees. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, next up for consideration is Health Committee with Mercy is Gerda Whitaker. Uh, Mercy. Hi, thanks. Our committee met on Tuesday, February the 9th, 11 o'clock via Zoom. The administration and CVS are to be commended for conducting excellent vaccination clinics at Charlestown. The intermissions program, which combats isolation and promotes socialization in a fun way for those who have some level of memory difficulties is a great respite for spouses who are caregivers as well. The program has a few openings and runs four days a week with, two, with four two hour sessions a day. Information is available on the ccicicharleston.org website. The Low Vision Reading Brigade seeks those needing the service as we have volunteers ready to help. Continuing care council meetings are still on hold due to COVID-19 restrictions, but the residents there continue to enjoy individual activities in their rooms. I'll look forward to the transition to Wilton Overlook in March. The Maryland State Ombudsman Program is focusing on completing annual reports and continuing training without on-site visits. 
Problems with hearings and getting residents ready for the hearings are problematic as on-site visits are not possible. The program may receive some funds from the Department of Aging and will target abuse of the elder. The Virginia I. Jones Council met on Jan January 27th and continues to work on the state mandated version of the 2012 Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Report. The Maryland General Assembly is considering many bills related to health and health care issues, such as essential caregiver visitation, dementia quality of care in assisted living, elder abuse, earlier notification to nursing home residents when changes in their conditions occur, and more inspections for new nursing homes. Difficulty getting vaccines into smaller assisted living facilities and tracking those who received their first dose and then are discharged before their second dose and the controversy over mandatory vaccines for staff are areas of concern. Delegate Sample Hughes had two bills introduced that address staff training and admission and discharge criteria in dementia care facilities. Unfortunately, House Bill 416 on healthcare facilities, assisted living programs, memory care, and Alzheimer's disease unit re regulations was canceled at the request of lobbyists citing prohibitive costs. However, Senator Pan Bidel is hopeful that its counterpart Senate Bill 204 will get out of the Senate and cross over to the House. The Senate bill had a hearing scheduled on the Finance Committee for February the 11th. All are, were encouraged to write letters of support to state legislators or to call them to express our views on the impact these bills will have on Charlestown. Virtual testimony is permitted for hearings. You can track information on these bills on our CCI Charleston website under the Residence Council Health Services Committee website. Articles on health-related issues are also posted on the website. Administration has been contacted to express concerns regarding a more safety-conscious method of medication delivery to residents' shelves. The next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, March the 9th via Zoom. All are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. Mm -hmm. You have a busy committee and a lot of things you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, next up was housekeeping with Betty Elder. Thank you, Walt. Uh, the Housekeeping Committee met on February 19, 2021 via Zoom. Uh, there were 14 people in attendance. Ms. Michelle Fenn represented the CCI Charlestown staff. Resident inspectors were concerned about the cleanliness and sanitization of the elevators, especially the panels and buttons. A lot of handprints were still noted on several of the elevators, possibly by outside contractors. Jesse Morgan will be addressing those complaints. Emergency cleaning can be brought to the attention of the CCI Charlestown staff. If any resident notices items which need immediate or emergency cleaning, they should report it themselves and they can use the My Erickson portal. Let Mr. Kirill Apostolov know if there are violations to trash and recycling. Ms. Fenn is looking into trash dumping outside, especially next to the dock doors at the St. Charles. This is a source of rodent infestation. Maintenance items noted by the housekeeping committee members were shared with the maintenance and engineering committee chairperson. It was reported from Chris in maintenance that there is one painter assigned work orders for touch-up painting and gouges throughout the community. He will do aesthetic items once major items such as replacing lights and safety items have been cleared. Kudos to the hardworking Charlestown housekeeping staff, especially Kenneth and Zach. They're all still sanitizing high touch areas and doing their daily cleaning and restocking of restrooms. Several volunteers have vacated their positions and new advertisements for volunteers in the Sunburst, the bulletin board flyers and channel 972 have been submitted. New openings at Fountain Hill, New Carroll and Parkview 
still need to be filled. Ms. Fenn noted, uh, mentioned that there will be a general services town hall in the next couple of weeks. Trash dumping will be addressed by the housekeeping department. Our next meeting is on Friday, March 19, 2021 at 2 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, next, we have the Legislative and Political Committee with Pat Bain. Hello, everybody. The Legislative Political Committee held its monthly meeting on Wednesday, February the 10th at 10 a.m. with 21 members in attendance. The meeting began with the approval of the minutes of the prior meeting, but the first item of business was to approve the plan for three 30-minute programs on TV 972, highlighting key legislation before the 2021 General Assembly, which is now in session. The committee approved the name of the series, What's Up in Annapolis 2021, and the contents and pre presenters for What's Up in Annapolis 2021 are the first show, proposed legislation in the areas of voting and election law, presented by Phil Lansing, Eleanor Lewis, and Don Sillers. That show was on today, on Charlestown today. It was on at 10 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., 8 p.m., and it's not too late, folks. You can see it tonight at 10 p.m. TV show number two, legislation in the area of health care, health care service delivery, senior consumer issues, and equity issues, and that's Janet Allen, Wendell Thompson, and Ann P. McKay. They should be on next week, and I will be sending out announcements when we know exactly what day. The third show, proposed legislation in the area of environment and conservation. We hope to highlight major climate change legislation, which is before the General Assembly right now, along with recycling bills. And the presenters are Donna Martin, Anna Marie, our own Anna Marie, Mark Tewsbury, and Bonnie Kowaki. There are two options that you have for accessing information about the status of legislation of interest to you, Charlestown residents, you can go on the Maryland General Assembly website or you can go to the resident, Charlestown residents website and go to track Maryland legislation. And this site includes a list of all the bills that we are tracking through the committee. And it also has links to the General Assembly website. And here's something really exciting. The House and Senate are now, all of the hearings and all of their sessions are on YouTube we have links on the website to those YouTube channels and you can watch all the committee hearings you would like to watch as well as the sessions of the legislature. Uh, the meeting concluded with committee members reporting on the status of the bills they're tracking and we will meet again on March the 10th on Zoom at 10 a.m. That's the report. Thank you, Pat. You're gonna keep us busy watching, the, watching TV or YouTube. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have meeting. Can I ask Pat a question? Question, please. Did, did that meeting really adjourn at 1.15 that started at 10? Oh, that might be a typo. Let's see. If I'm sure that's a, be a really long meeting. <laughs> at 11 15, I say a.m. <laughs> I think it was 11.15. Yes, it was. Okay. Missing a one. Yeah, I don't remember being there that long. <laughs> <laughs> and a.m., not p.m. Yes. <laughs> So uh, now we'll move along uh, to maintenance and engineering with Jackie Graham. Jackie, you're muted. I'm sorry. There we go. Mm -hmm. The committee met on Tuesday, February the 23rd at 2 p.m. via Zoom. Nine members met with General Services, Kevin Crawford and Don Huffman. The General Services update Mr. Crawford explained that many projects have been chosen for updated pricing. The process of prioritizing and rescheduling is still under review. An email from Mr. Crawford has it advised that the following projects are likely to be rescheduled for next year. Auditorium stage renovations, Brookside Herbert Run hallways, refectory dining room, and shuttle tracker. It is also reported that the structural floor repairs at Bridges, though completed, are, in, are an issue. General Services working with vendors to correct or replace necessary areas. 
painting stripes at newly installed stop signs to be addressed. The Nature Trail Bridge is scheduled to be repaired this spring. The pool should reopen within the next two to three weeks. General Service is working with vendors concerning control of exterior lighting. Worn carpeting on Brookside's fourth and sixth floors outside of elevators will be addressed. Poor circulation on the fourth floor in Brookside, general service to investigate possible equipment problems. And I received an email from Mr. Crawford today. They have repaired that problem and I've talked to a couple of the residents and they seem to think everything is okay at this time. General services is to investigate controlled lighting at Cross Creek. Residents are using the card room beyond 9 p.m. The elevator enunciator malfunctioning to be investigated. I also received an email from Mr. Crawford. They've corrected the enunciator in the Brookside elevator. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, March the 23rd at 2 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, Jackie. Um, seeing no questions, let's move on to resident life. I don't think Ron Fair is here. I'll be glad um, to read for so you, Walt. Will take over. Thank you, Mimi. Four items were discussed. Volunteering. Stephanie Knowles, the volunteer coordinator, lists 800 resident volunteers, no external volunteers due to COVID. She has as needed volunteers for restaurants needing phone orders, et cetera. Her office will help recruit for groups and clubs, floor captains, new groups such as helping vets heal, a potential group to help women who have had mastectomies, et cetera. There's a Zoom program for relatives of continuing care residents. Stephanie needs one-on-one -on -one volunteers to brighten an independent living residence days. She explained the process for welcoming new residents, receiving a welcome package. Friendly visitors is currently in place. Residents wishing to volunteer should meet with Stephanie for guidance. Cindy suggested adding sports clubs such as Ravens and Oriole fan get together groups. Reporting mission moments. For mission moments, Phil Lansing urged residents, re, urged reporting of residents helping others to her. They are acknowledged monthly in the sunburst. Communications project. For the project to foster better communication, David Elder discussed the potential formation of a meet and greet, greet group and solicited ideas to foster conversation by phone and computer. One model to look at is the successful Zoom happy hour hosted by Ann McKay. The showcase of decorated lobbies. Cindy suggested showcasing individual elevator lobbies using 972, ccicharlestown.org, and the Sunburst with photos monthly. Photographers are wanted. Thank you, Mimi, for filling in. You're welcome. <laughs> Next up, we have safety and security with Ed Wallace. Ed, you're mute. There we go. I should be unmuted now, hopefully. Uh, the meeting opened at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, February the 9th, with six committee members, two council members, and one Charlestown representative present. Uh, the following items were discussed. Uh, cybersecurity, the fourth and final article on cybersecurity for seniors was published in the February sunburst. Um, Tom Moore has uh, graciously uh, put some films back onto channel 972 on fire prevention uh, that were shown a couple of years ago. Um, I talked to him and he uh, was gracious enough to put them back on uh, this year again. Um, uh, we were attempting to determine the number of falls uh, from last year. Uh, security has announced that or announced to me that uh, they are no longer allowed to provide fall information. Uh, it has to be Charlestown administration has to provide that information. And currently, I'm waiting for answers. Um, 
as HIPAA. We're also uh, noting that some people from CVS are leaving medicine on shelves, uh, which they're not supposed to do. Uh, uh, I've contacted the medical com committee to find out who should be aware of that problem, and that turns out to be administration. So I've got that question into administration as well with having, without having an answer. Um, we reported an exit door at Herbert's Run was broken uh, last month. Uh, at the time of the uh, meeting, security was waiting for a part to repair it. Uh, since then, the door has been repaired. Um, June is National Safety Month, and we're going to start planning on what we can be doing uh, to address that. And Fall Prevention Month is coming up in September. Uh, and we want to start doing some planning on that as well. Uh, next meeting will be held on March the 9th at 1 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, now we move on for Pat Payne's second report of the session, uh, the nominating committee. Rock. Hey. Rock. Hmm? Question? Now, I have a comment on what Ed said about the um, CVS leaving medications on the shelf and things like that. Um, I have I have contacted Clara Clara about that, and um, I'm sure that they've they've been very busy with the vaccination clinics, and that's why they haven't gotten back to us. But um, she was supposed to contact um, the pharmacist regarding that. Um, Thank you, uh, Betty. Uh, well, um, I, I wanted to also mention that. Uh, Originally, we had uh, medications that were left out there, but the last couple of times, if we weren't in, uh, they left a message, you know, like a, a little uh, note saying that there's a, we attempted to deliver medication, but nobody was home. So I think they may be alerted to this now. So this was like uh, uh, last uh, Friday mm -hmm. and uh, I went today to pick it up. So it's just one of those things. I think, I think they know more about it than they let on now. Okay, just FYI. Thank you. That's very good to know. Okay. And then now we'll call on Pat Bain again. Um, I have a comment. Sure. Um, I think that they have instituted now that they don't deliver the medication unless you're there. Because uh, I wanted something delivered. We arranged a time that I would be there. So, you know, they would be able to deliver it at that time. But it all worked out fine. So I think it's probably straightened out, but not communicated to everyone. <laughs> well, we've taken a step forward to communicate it now. Thanks. And any, are any other comments or questions? I'll call on Pat again. Okay. The nominating elections committee held meetings on January the 29th and February the 19th. And all the members of the committee were present at both meeting as we reviewed the list of names of potential candidates for election to the residence council. It's a fascinating meeting because what we do is have a shared spreadsheet and Hope is able to fill in all the information as we talk. It makes it very efficient. It's really quite something. It makes the meetings very brief, but an awful lot is accomplished during the time. Packets have been sent out to the uh, proof the candidates are willing to be uh, run for residence council. Posters inviting residents to consider becoming candidates are now located in the lobby areas at Charlestown and also being shown on TV 972. We're encouraging residents as well as members of residence council to contact us and let us know of any suggestions you have for candidates. And the members of the committee are Joan Green, Bill Miller, Diane Lyons, Wendell Thompson, Sherry Stewart, Pat Casuda, Hope Tillman, and Anna Maria is our co-chair. The next meeting will be held this coming Friday, March 10th at noon. Thank you, Pat. Doing great work. <laughs> I know we'll have a good slate before we're through here. Well, that wraps up our committee reports. Does anybody else have any last questions or comments? If not, I see that Heather Sheridan is among us now. And uh, we'll turn it over to her for comments from the administration. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, 
So I've been taking some notes. Uh, we've got a lot of really good updates for you and some answers to some of the questions that you've, you've uh, left here today. Um, first, we are thrilled to report that we have, um, oh, we have zero um, independent living residents who are COVID positive. We have zero people living on our COVID cohort in continuing care. This is the first time we have these numbers. So we should all feel really see some claps. That's exciting. Um, and our, um, we have four positive employees, unfortunately, and about 15 employees that are out. Um, as Walt mentioned, it's almost a year to the day that we had our first case of our first COVID case here at Charlestown. It was March 6th last year. And as of almost a year to the day, um, we have we will be completing our final clinic on Thursday. Um, Monday's yesterday's clinic, we had 734 residents come through to get their second shot. It's tremendous. Um, we've gotten a lot of really good feedback about the flow of the, the clinic. So we're really excited about how successful they were. Thursday's clinic will be a few residents that couldn't make it, about 40 that couldn't make it on Monday employees and um, we were able to um, extend uh, opportunities to family members with um, for extra shots. Um, we had CVS brought extra shots last time and we were able to um, have a lottery for those employee family members um, that met the governor's criteria for receiving shots. So, that was tremendous. So we feel really good about that, getting as many shots in arms so no shots go to waste. So we feel good about that. Um, <clears throat> we had 23 settlements throughout January and February so far. So sales is knocking it out of the park. Their goals were 18 for the, as of this year, or as of this point in the year, and they've already surpassed that goal. So they're working very hard, but, um, what you said earlier this, in the meeting, you all are our best advocates and our best um, testimony to living here. So please continue to outreach to your friends as Pat recommended. Um, there's also been some questions about Wi-Fi. So um, that's been mentioned on the 972 updates in the morning. Um, our Wi-Fi upgrade is still happening. It is absolutely a priority, especially with COVID and all the Zoom meetings and Netflix watching and streaming that you're all doing. Um, as, as Clara mentioned, I believe two updates ago, um, the supplies are called access points. We refer to them as APs. Um, and they unfortunately were stuck in um, uh, delivery from China uh, for a, a bit of a a bit of a time, which was unexpected for us. So that's pushed our start date for all of this, but the APs will be arriving, we've been told this month, and we anticipate starting our Wi-Fi upgrade project um, in early April. More communications are gonna come about that. We're gonna have some stuff on 972 and letters and things of that nature so that the buildings that we will be beginning the upgrade will be notified and timelines will be clear and, and everybody will have the information that they need. The alcohol policy that did come up earlier this meeting and as Ken mentioned, I just confirmed with him while we were sitting here, he we we're going to discuss it. We're in conversations with him tomorrow. We're gonna to have a touch base with him so he'll be able to provide an update on Friday um, about uh, whether or not we can allow that uh, here at Charlestown. But we've heard you and we absolutely are getting answers uh, as soon as we can. We'll share that in a few days. Um, and reopening plans. There's a lot of exciting things coming our way. So now that we, um, as of March 18th, um, everyone will, who received a shot, employees and residents will be um, the 10, will, will be the 10 day mark since your second shot. So um, we um, had a call, we've had a few calls with our corporate partners about what reopening will look like. There's a lot of good things to come on that. So we're excited to start sharing that hopeful news with you all re related to um, gatherings and church and um, different, all, all the things that you've asked questions about. But life is starting to slowly come back. We can't do everything the way it was. And there's still county regulations, which are slightly more strict um, here in Baltimore County. So 
more to come, but get excited about that. And um, Patty wanted us to mention that the Scholars Campaign kicks off on Monday, March 15th, and we have 40 scholars and they have masks that they have with the Scholars logo. So definitely give them a wave, give them a virtual high five for their, <laughs> for their great achievement. Um, the pool is officially reopening March 11th. That was a question. So March 11th is the date. Um, and the medication being left on the package shelves, we absolutely did reach out to CVS. They responded quickly. Um, we think there might have been some, it, it's good to hear that from you all that there, that seems to be improving. So um, we're glad, just wanted to confirm with you on that. And Ed, um, please send me your questions about falls because I have not seen your email specifically. I apologize, but I am overseeing that effort. So I'm happy to, to I would love to see your questions so that we can get some answers for you all. That's all we have. Thank you. That's a very nice report to hear. Very positive. They haven't always been in the past year. So thank you very much. Evan. True. I'm the lucky one. <laughs> <laughs> well, any more comments from anybody? Uh, do I see a hand up, Ron Diabro? Yes, Heather. Yeah. Um, could you tell us what the... Um, staff participation rate was in the vaccine program? That's a great, you've been getting that question a lot. Um, we're not, um, so there's a couple things to account for that. We, we can't obviously tell you who and who hasn't, that's a HIPAA violation, but in terms of overall numbers, um, we're, we're still, so Thursday is our, our final opportunity for employees to get their shots. It's not something we could mandate. And I would encourage, um, each of you as you're getting back to um, meeting with your groups. Um, it was shared that some group leads are requiring proof of a vaccine before participating in groups. We discourage you all from asking residents and employees about their vaccination status. It's not something that we could require. It's also not something that all the employees are able to get. If they didn't get their shot at Charlestown, they're not able age-wise able to get it outside of Charlestown. So we may have some more information about final numbers in the coming weeks, but it's not something that we're able to disclose at this point, and it's not something we can mandate. I, I had a, uh, a quick question regarding the, is it legal um, to make vaccinations a requirement of employment? No. It's not legal. Okay. Even if malaria and that kind of thing were going around, uh, well, thankfully, we don't have to worry about malaria, but that well, might change. We may have other <laughs> pandemics coming down the road. We don't right. Know. It's, it's a good question. Um, it's, there, different employers are taking different stances on it, and we have, have not made it mandatory. Um, as a, um, There's also a lot of, as maybe you all were asking your own doctors about getting the vaccine or your family members have, there's a lot of personal reasons why people have not or, or do not feel like they can get the vaccine. So we just have to remember that and take all that into account in terms of mandating and connecting it to employment. That would get really sticky. Were there many residents who refused the vaccine? So no, we had a 97% participation rate roughly of, of uh, residents um, receiving the vaccine. So that's exciting. Um, and I think, you know, that's a really good thing. And that's allowing us to, to get to those reopening stages that we all want to be back to. As other questions? Well, if not, let's close down the meeting. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Uh, we'll meet again. Well, we have a Thank you. session next week. Thanks, Heather. Sure, Bye. thank you. Everybody, a week, a month from now. Thank you. And see y'all. <laughs>